Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for waiting for me. Nothing like a little bit of traffic as you're making your way from one office to another. There's never a dull moment in a, a private practice with myofunctional therapy. So what I want to talk about today is something that I am truly passionate about, um, and it is myofunctional therapy and a speech therapist role in myofunctional therapy. Um, I don't know, I hope you guys throughout the webinar today will take some time to post some questions. Just let me know you're out there, introduce yourself. I have an amazing team with me here today, clearly, as they got me totally set up to just run in and, and do this. Um, but I've got Angelo, who's my technology expert, and I've got Julie, who is my right-hand woman, does everything and um, has learned more about myofunctional therapy and, and running a business within it. Um, so she's here to help me out and, and a couple others. So um, anytime you have a question or you just want to give a shout out with a remark, um, I would absolutely love to hear your comments and your questions. Um, I'm taking it that all four or five, whoever, how many, how many people we have today, um, that everybody's a speech therapist. Is that correct, Julie? Okay, great. So you guys already know that as speech therapists, we have our toolbox. And while some of us might be experts in one area within the field, uh, somebody else might have expertise in others. Well, um, our licensure and our um, certification gives us the ability to be able to provide myofunctional therapy. And what I want to talk about today is what myofunctional therapy is, what myofunctional disorders look like, what they can look like in your practice, and then some different treatment options that you have um, that you can use within your approach to treating them. Um, and then I really want to get you excited about some of the products and um, programs that I've created to see if you guys might want to learn a little bit more. So let's get started here. Um, Angelo, if I want to move right into the PowerPoint, I know there's something that I got to do with my fingers. Four fingers. Four fingers. To the left. To the left. No, no, no. You're oh, thank you. See, now I don't know if they can still see me. Yes. Okay, you guys can see me, but I can't see myself. So um, I can see the PowerPoint that is showing up in your window. Um, so what I've done is compiled a little bit of information about myofunctional therapy. And actually, if you take a look at this picture of this little adorable girl, um, she's a client who has made some real nice drastic changes um, in her time at Simon Says. And, you know, you're going to start, I, I say that I always ruin people when it comes to myofunctional therapy because once, you know, I give you a little introduction and you might already be able to identify people with myofunctional disorders, um, you're going to walk around and you're going to see everybody who has some myofunctional needs. Well, this little one um, was a friend of one of my daughters and I ran into her family at the mall and she was homesick with yet another um, sinus and allergy infection. And I noticed that she had an open bite. So we started talking about, was she a thumb sucker? Was she a pacifier user? And it turned out that she actually did not have any oral habits. But when I took a little peek in her mouth, I realized that she was severely tongue tied. So we spent um, a couple months getting her into the right specialists. She ultimately had a lingual frenulum clipping. Um, underneath her tongue. She's had incredible change with her range of motion. She's seen and started treatment with an orthodontist um, so that we can try to pull that closure and close up that anterior bite. And I've been doing some speech therapy, some myofunctional therapy with her, which has made some drastic change. So I, I joke around that this little one is my poster child um, because she wants to be a star and I told her she could be my myofunctional star. So. Uh, you'll see her throughout the presentation a little bit. But let's talk a little bit about what myofunctional therapy is. I don't know if any of you know anything about myofunctional therapy. Has anybody had any experience? Shout out some comments to Julie. Let us know if anybody has provided myofunctional therapy before. Um, but myofunctional therapy is essentially a set of exercises and therapeutic techniques that sole purpose is to repattern and optimize oral and facial function. So basically we're using these exercises to retrain the muscles of your face, of your tongue, to get some symmetry, to get some harmony, and to get correct resting posture of the tongue, 
for speech swallowing and um, at rest. And I want you to think of this. I mean, you know, I've had 20 plus years of um, experience in the neurogenic field. I worked with stroke and brain injury patients for 20 years. So that was my first love within the field of speech pathology. And I think that that's why, um, for me personally, myofunctional therapy has been a good match for me um, as I've, you know, continued to morph and, and change as a therapist. But it's really a neurologic re-education. We are retraining the brain on how the muscles should work, how the muscles should move, how the mus muscles should function, and how the muscles should be at rest. And then we're habitu habituating that into everyday life. So that's really what myofunctional therapy is. If you can take a peek at the gentleman at the top of the screen, and another poster child, I, do, I just adore him, not only personally, but professionally. Um, so I have you know permission to use Tyler's name, but Tyler was somebody who had a lifelong tongue thrust. He, his parents joke that every single picture they have of him as a young child, um, his tongue is hanging out of his mouth, sometimes with a little bit of drool, open bite, tongue squeezing through, didn't matter whether he's the messiest eater at the table, he was a fast eater at the table, um, he would spit on people when he would speak, and you can see this adorable little guy is successful in so many aspects of his life, but this was one area that he started to get self-conscious about, um, just about the time that he came to see me. So we got him connected with an orthodontist um, that, <laughs> Julie's falling off to my right. Um, it's one of those mornings. So uh, we got him connected with an orthodontist that actually wanted to start some early intervention with a two-phase treatment. Orthodontia has changed so much throughout the years. Um, hey, Angela, will you do me a huge favor? Will you close that, the, um, or just lower the, that window just a little bit? That sun is just, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Orthodontia has changed so much through the years. You know, back in the day when we were younger, um, I might be a lot older than some of you, so you can you might not have had this experience, but back in the day they would put headgear on us and try to pull forward our maxilla, um, or I'm sorry, pull back our maxilla to compensate for any forward movement of it. Nowadays they really have a different approach to it and they use expanders to expand the palate and make room for all the teeth. So Tyler was a candidate for that. He um, had a narrow and vaulted palate. His tongue was in a forward anterior posture, he had an open bite, and he had some expansion and front four braces to make room for the other teeth to make their way down. As soon as that expander came out, we started in with intensive myofunctional therapy, and we started retraining the tongue for proper posture during rest, during swallowing, and during speech. And he has made tremendous improvements. Um, you can even see, I I'm pointing, but if you can look at the picture on the right where he's in the red shirt, his post picture, you can see how much more symmetry he has of his face. That his his right nasolabial fold has really evened out. It's almost pulling down on the picture on the left. And now we see such symmetry between the right and the left side from his eye all the way down to his um, jaw. So Ironically, his mom's an occupational therapist, and she's the one who pointed out those symmetrical changes. And um, I was so pleased that she noticed it as much as I did as well. So uh, she was great. So that's what myofunctional therapy is. Let's talk about I knew it was going to jump around what myofunctional therapy includes. So myofunctional therapy might include eliminating oral habits. We always eliminate oral habits first and foremost. Um, you've got to get that thumb or those fingers or that pacifier out of the oral cavity, out of the mouth, before you can do anything else. Um, you, you then will teach people how to breathe nasally. You might be working in conjunction, and we'll, I'll talk a lot about this later about your interdisciplinary team, but you will work with your ENTs to Make sure that that patient can adequately breathe through their nose. Make sure that there isn't some kind of a deviated septum, a structural abnormality, some kind of congestion or um, 
obstruction that might be preventing them from breathing adequately nasally. Um, and then we will teach them how to close their mouth and breathe. Then we will work on correcting their oral tongue resting posture. You know, while you guys are sitting here listening to me, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at Angela, I'm looking at Julie, I'm thinking about myself, and I know that my lips are closed when I'm at rest and my tongue is on the roof of my mouth. How many of you guys have your tongue resting on your roof of the mouth? You know, give Julie a little, give us a little post, a little shout out and let us know if anybody is sitting with their lips closed, breathing through their nose and their tongue on the roof of your mouth. If that is the case, then you are in correct oral posture. If your mouth is open and your tongue is ha hanging forward in any way, shape or form, then that might be something that is a myofunctional indicator or red flag for you. Um, after we make sure we have adequate tongue posture, we will instruct our patients on how to chew and swallow correctly. You know, um, speech therapists, we are experts in dysphagia, right? We have so much experience in swallowing disorders and we spend so much time in grad school talking about the oral phase of swallowing, the pharyngeal phase of swallowing, and sometimes talking about the esophageal phase of swallowing and how to compensate when there's an error or when there's struggles or difficulties, what normal and what abnormal swallowing looks like. Well, myofunctional therapy and our approach to swallowing is a big piece of the puzzle. And in um, my three-day seminars, I talk a lot about what we are doing in today's society and how we are ruining our little people because from the first moment they come out to trying breastfeed, having extensive and extended use of bottle and sippy cup use, morphing into excessive use of pureed foods, we are not giving our little ones the chance to use what God gave them, to use the musculature of the face and the jaw and the teeth and the tongue to be able to chew more hearty foods and then swallow them correctly. Now we all know that um, babies have this infant tongue thrust reflex, right? This reflex that is just innately a natural thing that you see when you first give, if any of you have children or you've ever watched a baby be fed, you know that when you first give those few bites of pureed food, they push their tongue out. And, and, and as a new mom, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm pushing the food in, but they're pushing the food out. I'm putting the food in and they're spitting it right back out. But that's actually a natural, natural way for infants to swallow. They're using their tongue thrust reflex. And eventually, over the course of time, that reflex goes away and the tongue learns to migrate up on the roof of the mouth and slide back along the palate to help propel food back from the oral cavity through into the pharyngeal cavity safely. Um, but for those who never get the opportunity to learn correct lingual posture for swallowing, um, not only does it affect the way that they eat through childhood and adulthood, but now we've learned and there's evidence to show that that tongue thrust can actually affect them later in life. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Just at last year's ASHA, there was a brilliant professor who's now retired from Idaho State. And he was talking about correlation between earlier presence of tongue thrust and later prevalence of oral and then ultimately pharyngeal dysphagia um, when a neurological event has been introduced or some kind of neurologic um, incident has, has, has caused damage to the muscles. So now we know that myofunctional therapy is something that's so very important at the young age because those chewing and swallowing patterns that take place at a younger age in life can affect us when we're older and put us at risk. Then in myofunctional therapy, we try to habituate those good habits. It does nothing for somebody if they learn a correct swallow, but they don't learn how to do that correct swallow when they're drinking multiple sips from a cup, when they're using a straw, when they're chugging a drink of water from a cup, when they're eating all three meals during the day. Learning one correct swallow does not habituate that habit into everyday life. So we work a lot on that. Um, habituation phase of treatment. 
And then, of course, you know, my favorite part of myofunctional therapy is the fact that speech therapists can correct those speech sound errors. Nobody can tell you that providing just exercises to the tongue is going to rep some is going to correct somebody's speech sound errors. That's erroneous. You might see improvements, and for some, it might change it. But our scope of practice allows us to really get into those sound errors that we see. And I'll show you the patterns that you'll see with, uh, with tongue thrust and with these myofunctional disorders. Any questions so far? Anything popping up? Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. So let's look at some pictures. Let's see. What do these have in common? I gave you the answer at the top that should like slide in later. But we see a little cutie pie up in the left hand corner and she is sucking her thumb. And of course, we see infants, we see them in utero um, when we see their sonograms and then they come out sucking their thumb. The things I want you to take notice of in this picture is that as she's got her thumb up on her palate, she is push, push, pushing up on the palate, creating a fingerprint and changing the shape of that palate. She's pulling the maxilla forward with enough force and pressure that over time she's gonna change the jaw. She's gonna change her face. And lastly, I want you to see that her tongue is underneath the thumb, resting down and forward. If we sit all day or all night in that posture, we start to have an effect and we start to train the tongue to work improperly within the mouth. And that starts to have some long-term consequences, right? All right, then when we look at the second um, picture in the middle, we can see that there is um, an open bite and we can see the tongue sitting between the teeth. So what is this evidence of? This is evidence of a pure tongue thrust, an anterior tongue thrust. And this could come from many reasons. This could come from prolonged thumb sucking. This could come from finger sucking. This could come from um, a tongue tie. There are many different reasons why somebody might have this presentation. Do you have a question for Sure, Emily? sure. So do you have to wait until orthodontic work is done before you start working on sounds? Not at all. We, you know, I think uh, something that happens so, so commonly and many times within my practice is I will get somebody who's referred from the orthodontist or even from a pediatrician or just from a friend's referral and they will say, this person has a tongue thrust. And I'll say, well, tell me a little bit about your speech therapy history. And they'll say, oh my gosh, when, I, when, when they were younger, they got therapy to correct their S's. And either A, yes, their S's sound perfect and they sound terrific, but the problem is the speech therapist corrected the speech sound, but she didn't correct the resting posture of the tongue or the swallow. Or that patient comes in and they still have such problems with their speech sounds, which tells me that the therapist the therapist spent a lot of time trying to fix the speech sounds, but the muscle of the tongue was just too weak to be able to correct it. So in answer to your question, Emily, there is no exact time that you can work on the speech sounds. You can work on it anytime. The only thing I ask is that you are also working on the muscle of the tongue. You are therapeutically with exercises, working it out, making it stronger so that it can adequately make those speech sounds. Um, Angela, you are a total doll. I've been running from patient to patient and then for a webinar. Ah, thank you. All right, so I hope that that answers your question. Um, I get people at all different phases and places along the continuum. So I might see somebody prior to orthodontia therapy. I might see somebody when they're already in orthodontic treatment. Um, and I might also be the first line of defense and say, you need, you've been thumb sucking, you have speech sound errors, you need to go see an orthodontist, it's at that age, it's worth a referral, and then you find the ones that do free consultations so that that patient can go at no charge and get an assessment. And hopefully you send them to the, to the orthodontist that you have in your interdisciplinary team 
so that you know that you guys refer back and forth to each other and that that orthodontist will have the right treatment approach for that patient and what their needs are. Um, let me know if you have any more questions about that. Over here to the right, um, you will see a little guy who is, can you guess it? He is just all around low tone. Low tone, open mouth posture, open mouth breathing, tongue hanging forward, probably has a diastema because you can see the big huge spacing between the two front teeth, um, unless he already has expansion in, which also cause that, causes that presentation. You can see that that upper lip um, and the lower lip cannot even meet um, and they need to be worked out. Over to the left, in the left-hand side, in the lower side, we have um, somebody who presents with a short lingual frenulum and can also be called tongue tie, can also be called ankle glossia, um, short frenum. You, you hear a lot of different terms used for this, but the presentation might vary within the range of motion that somebody has but we have measuring tools, range of scale measuring tools that we use to measure the differential between the mouth opening and the lingual elevation to the ridge with the mouth opening. And if you have less than 50% difference, then that tells you that that person does not have adequate range of motion of their tongue. I just went yesterday to an appointment with a client who has severe ankyloglossia at a 3% differential. He could open his mouth 65 millimeters, but he could only touch the ridge at three millimeters. That's about this far. So he had no ability to open with his tongue staying on the ridge. Now, mind you, this child had a narrow vaulted palate, was a thumb sucker, had speech sound errors, had been in speech therapy for six years, had breathing issues and was a mouth, uh, no, he was a nasal breather, but always felt like he couldn't breathe adequately and had some chewing and swallowing issues. So we start to see the bigger picture that having a tongue tie can start to have an effect, an effect on your speech, an effect on your face, an effect on the resting posture of your tongue. Um, so gratefully, he ironically had gone to an ENT, I mean, an oral surgeon over the summer who did a clipping with no change, no stitches, no um, change within the range of motion. So yesterday's oral surgeon told them a different way that they approach the treatment, and I believe that they're gonna go back and have the procedure done again, because it wasn't done adequately the first time. So another point, you have to make sure you hook up with the right professionals, the ones that get the job done correct the first time, so that you're not sending these patients back for multiple procedures. They're just not gonna wanna do it. They're gonna wanna be, they're gonna be scared, and that you need them to have a good outcome so that you can be effective in what you're doing. Little guy in the middle is, is a Shih Tzu, and Shih Tzus always have tongue thrusts. You will see them all around with their tongue hanging out of their mouth, so cute. He could use a little myofunctional therapy. Um, the picture all the way over to the right, can anybody identify what you see in the picture in the lower right-hand side? Um, I'm gonna ask where can you get measuring tools from? Okay, so, Therabyte is one company that sells them, and they're called Range of Motion Scales. And you can get them either, I've tried to order them online at Amazon, but I believe right now they're unavailable. So we just have to kind of re keep rechecking. Oh, they are available. Yes, great. So go on Amazon and order those. Another place where you can get them is from a colleague of mine who is amazing. I'm looking for her pamphlet right now. Um, she has a company called Mayo Made Easy, and Rhonda is a doll, and she, um, oh, I was looking to see if I had any pamphlets in my office. Um, she provides all kinds of different myofunctional tools, and one of them is the range of motion scales. So again, it's called Mayo Made Easy, and that's another um, option for getting tools. Did anybody come up with what the picture on the right has okay I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is it's lingual scalloping so if you can just take a peek and see that along the ridges of her tongue on the sides mind you she can't even open up her mouth and stick out her tongue without using her lips to hold it so that shows you a little bit of the weakness that she has going on but um 
when the tongue rests improperly within the mouth, it can actually rest here in between the teeth. And if it rests in between the teeth enough with enough amount of time, it can create imprints within the tongue. And that's what lingual scalloping is. When you see this, it should be a big red flag to you. Oh goodness, there's scalloping on the tongue. There must be improper positioning of the tongue at rest. Is it because the tongue is weak somewhere? Is it because the palate is narrow? Is it because the tongue is acting too wide in the mouth and we need to increase the musculature to make it more narrow or correct its um, placement? So these are all questions that you ask when you see lingual scalloping. Um, you know, you might ask, your, ask yourself, what's the long-term consequence of lingual scalloping? Who cares? Well, there is a huge consequence. Um, when you start to see it later in life, it becomes more and more prominent and can lead to oral cancers. So if that doesn't scare you and your patients, I, I, I don't know what would. Um, let's move on a little. Again, just in the comment I was making, what are the consequences of untreated myofunctional disorders? This is really a, greatly important because this gives your patients, this gives your doctors, this gives your patients a reason to go into treatment. It gives your doctors a reason to refer, and it gives you the biggest reason to treat. Your patients will have orthodontic relapse. I have a slew of 17-year-olds in my caseload right now, all who went through orthodontia, one, two phases, doesn't matter. Maybe they were told by the orthodontist to correct their tongue thrust. Maybe they weren't. Um, but when those braces came off, their teeth opened back up. Because a, a comment that I always make, and I will say it over and over again, is that muscle trumps bone. Okay, I'll say it again. The muscle always trumps the bone, and airway trumps everything. But the muscle of your tongue, it is small, but it is mighty. And while an orthodontist can align your teeth and make them so pretty, if the little muscle behind your teeth is constantly push, push, pushing, either through the middle or through the lateral sides of your teeth, it will make a mark. It will win, the muscle will win, and it will create a space within those teeth again. Um, and then of course, airway trumps everything. So if you can't breathe, what do we do? We open our mouth so we can breathe. Breathing is number one. Um, the, another consequence we see is periodontal disease and poor dental health. If somebody is constantly pushing their tongue against their bottom teeth like I just did when I swallowed, and they do that 500 to 2,000 times a day, it starts to leave a mark on the gum and can actually wear away those gums, leaving the root of the teeth exposed. So I've seen a lot of patients where we'll work on the tongue tips program just to get their tongue away from their teeth, and then they go and they have grafting done and they can correct their gum line. Malocclusion um, is a consequence of an untreated myofunctional disorder you will see open bites, you will see class twos with over jets, you will see class threes with under bites. So we can see tons of um, malocclusion just means bite problem or uh, um, discordance in your bite. You see a lot of jaw joint problems and facial pain. You can see TMJ issues when you don't treat a tongue thrust. If you are constantly pushing your tongue in an improper position, right now I have a little girl who whenever she would swallow and whenever she would say her palatal sounds, she would jut her bottom jaw forward in a forward motion every time she swallowed, every time she spoke. And no wonder she's getting clicking up here in the condyle. Of course she is because she's misusing the muscles within her face and she's misusing the muscles of her tongue. We see um, biting, we talked a little bit about this, biting issues, we see chewing issues, and we see swallowing abnormalities. So whether you call it tongue thrust, reverse swallow, immature swallow, um, these are all terms that you'll see um, and terms that you'll hear um, when you talk about a tongue thrust. Sometimes when you have this compensation with the tongue, people will grind their teeth, and you'll see this very even grinding or bruxing. Maybe the issue is improper positioning of the teeth, the tongue, and the facial muscles, and that's why we're seeing it. 
And of course, for me as a speech therapist, I can't talk about myofunctional disorders without talking about the lifelong misarticulations. Um, you will, like I said, you're already a speech therapist. You, you're already primed to notice errors in sibilant sounds, you know, a lisp, anterior lateral. You are primed to see palatal sound errors like SH, CH, and J, and J. But what you might not always notice is something, we know when people make an interdental alveolar sound, like a T, a D, an N, or an L, as in tip, top, do, dime, no, nelly, lily, lollipop. But when somebody makes it here, Lily, lollipop, do, dime. Perceptually, it can sound, or acoustically, it can sound okay, but visually, it does not. And when you see these patterns, the sibilant sounds, the palatal sounds, the alveolar sounds, those three classes of sounds are hallmark tongue thrust errors. Hallmark. So when you see those, you should have a red flag go off going, this person might have a tongue thrust. I may need to switch and do my tongue thrust to dowel. Um, and then, of course, other consequences are that many people have improper use of their facial musculature. So when somebody has an open bite and the tongue pushes forward when they swallow, well, nobody wants to swallow like this. So that was a, a timely picture that that took. <laughs> so um, they will try to close their lips. And if they have weak lips, they're going to start using other accessory muscles in the face to do it. They might use their masseter down here and get a little um, grimace. They might tense the obicularis oris, that muscle that runs in a circular fashion around the lips. And if you do this 500 to 2,000 times a day, it starts to leave a mark. And you start to see patients who have dents and dimples um, in their facial musculature just at rest. So again, the tongue tips program helps them alleviate and remediate these um, facial muscle movements that they're accessory ones that they're compensating with. So what do we do for these patients? What do we do when we are presented, somebody comes to our office, maybe they are referred for um, a speech sound error, maybe they're refer referred for a tongue thrust, maybe they're referred for breathing issues related to the tongue. Or maybe they're referred for something totally different, like a neutral R, and you take notice of all the red flags on your evaluation. What do you do? Well, you might utilize one of the two programs that um, Simon Says has to offer. There are two programs that um, I've created. You know, nine years ago, I was so fortunate, and I will always be incredibly grateful to um, an orthodontist that I went in to see an orthodontist and I was sitting next to a gentleman who probably had the worst tongue thrust, I, you know, a really bad tongue thrust. And I turned to my orthodontist and I said, Dr. Sheehan, what do you do with your tongue thrusters? And he said the answer that would change my life um, drastically. And he said, you know what? I send them to their school speech therapist. And I looked at him and I said, they can't touch them. Not only can they not touch them physically, but they, these children are not qualifying for services. A tongue thrust is likely not going to affect them academically or educationally. And so they would never qualify for services through the school. So those patients are getting pushed under the rug. And, I, and he said, but if you know what you're doing, I'll send them to you. And I was like, gosh, you know, I have a private practice for stroke and brain injury, this kind of Maybe that'll fit in the same wheelhouse, but I don't really know enough. I need to go get some training. So I fell upon a class presented by the IAOM, the International Association of Oral Myology. And um, at that point, Joy Moeller and Barbara Green were leading it together. It was four days. I spent an exorbitant amount of money. It was tremendous. I loved it. I sat in a room with 30 dental hygienists and dentists and orthodontists, and there were three speech therapists. And um, they presented programs that they used for myofunctional therapy. But the two things I walked away with 
or A, oh my gosh, this is totally in my wheelhouse. Speech therapists are made to provide myofunctional therapy. And two, um, my background as a speech therapist with oral motor and brain injury and stroke rehab kind of primes me for this. But I also left and I spent eight years going, E, I don't really know how to make this into a practice. Like I'm so used to my little um, world of rehab hospitals and um, home therapy recommendations. How am I gonna break into this? And and they gave me some suggestions, but I did not, um, I, I wanted to create my own tools because I felt like I needed to tailor it a little bit more towards speech therapists than towards um, all myofunctional practitioners. So. At that point, Joy and um, Barbara split, and there was the IAOM and the AOMT, the Association of Oral Myofunctional Therapy, I believe is how it's, um, what the acronym is for. And each of those entities continue to treat or teach dental hygienists, orthodontists, dentists, and some speech therapists in their classes. I've been lucky enough to take some of the AOMT um, advanced courses. The Buteco course on breathing was amazing and fantastic. Um, and then I came as an alumni to um, an AOMT intro course just to see if anything had changed over the years um, and to talk a little bit about um, how I developed my programs. So um, both of those entities are great. How Simon Says differs is that I tailor my programs solely to speech therapists because neither of those programs directly address speech sound errors and I believe that out of the three things that you treat, resting posture of the tongue, swallowing posture of the tongue, speech is number three on your list. And that we can't adequately complete our program if we don't directly treat those issues. Um, and dental hygienists and um, orthodontists and dentists, they're, they're not, it's not in their scope of practice. So we are lucky, we are fortunate to be speech therapists because we are credentialed and we are certified to be able to provide myofunctional therapy per ASHA's code of ethics, but we're also certified and in our scope of practice to provide speech sound error correction. So we've got the whole package, guys. We, it, it's us. Um, so the two programs that I have in, in uh, my practice, one is called Thumbs Up and one is called Tongue Tips. Let's start with Thumbs Up, which is so incredibly fun. It's amazing. It's one of the most fun things I do in my practice. It's a behavioral modification program. It is a 30 day reinforcement program that empowers the child to stop sucking their thumb, their fingers, their passy, or biting their nails. Um, it is a necessary first step to be able to address tongue thrust. You cannot address tongue thrust without correcting and taking out those um, negative imbalancing habits. So, we use a combination of um, fidgets and uh, magic lotion and posters and um, prizes and the parents help. And we use videos, training. I have, a, I have an amazing video that uses the whole concept of superheroes. I've created, I don't know if you can see me holding this up, but I recently released um, my first in a series of four comic books. And these comic books teach children why it's important to stop sucking. This one is called Thumbs Up Takes on Mr. Thumb. If you're going to ASHA, look for us. Thumbs Up is going to be there. You're going to see our superhero walking around. But Thumbs Up teaches children why it's important. Can you see this if I'm holding this up? Um, why it's important to stop sucking their thumb and what the consequences. And it is Andre, the graphic... Um, artist who made this is brilliant, brilliant. I'm so grateful to him for taking everything that I had in my mind and putting into this perfect, perfect little package. And in the back of the comic book, it even gives the child an opportunity to write their goals and talk about their strategies and put down their rewards that they've received. So this thing is the bomb. There are three more in, in the process of being made. There is um, thumbs up, fights, the fingers or fights, fight, fights the fingers. There, there's a whole slew of them that we've already written um, and Andre's working on the, the artistry behind them. So 
Thumbs Up is the most fun program. And I the, the program costs $400 um, for my clients. And I say to them, if you do everything I say over the course of the month and you still do not have success at the end of the month, I will give you $200 back because I never went into this business to take people's money without success. And if it just gives you an idea, over the course of nine years, I have only had to give money back twice, both extenuating circumstances. One with a severe anxiety, and for a four and a half year old, I would not do again. And two was a child who had a baby um, five weeks after finishing the program, and when the baby came out sucking their thumb, so did so did the eight year old little sister. Um, and I offered to come back in to remediate it, but mom was sleep deprived and said no, thank you. But other than that, I I have success. Everybody has success. Um, so, thumbs up is a great program. Tongue tips is a 12 session on average, okay? So if there's speech sound errors, sometimes that can extend to about 18 sessions. It incorporates therapeutic exercises for the lips, the tongue, um, and your facial, facial muscles. It teaches the new swallow. And of course, it incorporates speech therapy. I'm just gonna pull out my, I'm working on writing a workbook right now. Um, you know, there are books that have been out there in the past, like the um, Tongue Thrust book and Swallow Right, and you know, Marcel Richardson and uh, Roberta Price, they are pioneers in the field of myofunctional therapy. They're amazing. I've used their programs, I love them. And just as I've worked over the course of the past nine years, I've just continued to kind of add little things along the way that I think um, can add to um, some of the programs that are already out there. So I was just going to show you um, what Tongue Tips looks like. So Tongue Tips is a workbook that um, has icons, and those icons tell you different items and areas that you're working on. And then each week you receive um, exercises, therapeutic exercises, and they tell you what area you're working on, and you do them multiple times a day. As you get later in the program, there are different charts to complete, but that is um, mostly what they look like. And then, of course, on each page is not only the therapeutic exercises, but also the speech practice exercises. So you identify what speech sounds you're working on, and then you identify what level they're working on it, and then you give them, um, whether it's reading paragraphs or um, playing games or playing a card game um, or talking to um, strangers or family members using your good speech sounds. And then of course the last exercise is the infamous tongue plank. That is the one that teaches people how to correct the resting posture of their tongue, um, putting it on the roof of their mouth. So that is what tongue tips is. That's the repatterning. That's the neurologic education. Um, and in conjunction, either in communication with orthodontists, ENTs, pediatricians, the whole team can work together to have a great outcome for your patients. So usually when I go in and I do a presentation to an orthodontist, an ENT, a pediatrician, a dentist, so forth, I ask them questions. Um, and I pose these same questions to you. I ask, what do you do with your patients that are mouth breathers? Um, do you send them to an allergist in, or an ENT? Well, if they go and they find out that they are clear, what do you do with them? Do you try to teach them how to become a nasal breather? Do you try to strengthen the muscles of the lips or the tongue to get correct posture? I ask my orthodontist if they're currently using cribs or rakes, which are sharp appliances that come down from the palate in an effort to get people to stop sucking their thumb or thrusting their tongue forward. They hate using these appliances. The orthodontists don't want to use them. And if you find someone who does like them, they're not gonna be your partner in this process. You want the ones that don't like these um, appliances because a crib might prevent the tongue from pushing forward for a period of time. But as soon as the crib comes out, the tongue goes right back to the next barrier, which is the teeth. Um, and as far as a rake, a sharp rake for the thumb sucking, um, I don't know about you, I have four kids, but I don't wanna make my kids cry, bleed, and feel terrible. I wanna build them up. I wanna empower them and make them feel good about their success in life and not punish them for the fact that they've been sucking their thumbs since they were in utero, which is not their fault at all. Um, 
I ask my clients, um, or I ask my co-professionals if thumb or finger sucking is a problem for their patients. What do they do with the patients that have a forward resting tongue posture or have a, um, evident tongue thrust when they swallow? You know, you'll talk to these orthodontists and ironically, they'll say the tongue is like my enemy and I work so hard to align the teeth, but the tongue becomes my enemy. So um, you're, you then say, well, I'm here to help you with that. I'm like the insurance policy. They're spending eight to ten thousand dollars on orthodontia. I want them to sp spend an incremental amount to correct the resting posture of their tongue so that what you do can hold. Um, I talk to them about lingual and labial ties. I ask who they currently send their tongue thrust patients to. And then I will ask what they do for patients who have a relapse. So these are the questions I ask the professionals, but these are also questions that you might be thinking about as far as the patients that come into your practice. So we talked a little bit about this. Who is on your myofunctional team? I mean, on your interdisciplinary team? Speech therapists slash myofunctional therapists. Work with orthodontists, dentists, dental hygienists, ENTs, oral surgeons, pediatricians, and osteopaths if need be. These are your coworkers. And I think that because I worked in the hospitals for so long, I was so used to working in an interdisciplinary approach on a rehab team. You had your rehab physician, you had your neurologist, your neurosurgeon, your social worker, care, caseworker, your PT, OT, speech. So to me, this teamwork approach is just innate. And I'm hoping that you can learn that process as well. The key is to finding the right team members. If somebody is not supportive of myofunctional therapy and after you give them your explanation, they still don't maybe understand it, they might not be the right partner for you. Um, long ago, I sent a patient to an ENT for a lingual frenial clipping who had um, what I would rank as a level four or severe, and this was at Children's Hospital. I had worked with them on the craniofacial team, thought they'd be perfect, and they convinced the patient not to get the frenulum clipped. Ultimately, the patient was in braces for over three years. Braces came off, bite is still open um, because the tongue sits improperly in the mouth. It literally can't reach the palate. So got to find your right team members. Let's see if we can move to our last page. I don't really know. Well. It's stuck. It's stuck. Let's see. I'm just needs time. I know. I think I only have one more page, and that page is really thanking you, so we can actually phase out of this. How do I get out of this? Um, four to the left. There we go. There you go. Yeah. yeah, there it was. It just popped up. Four more questions. Do I go this way now, too? Yeah. And okay. there you go. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, now I don't really know if I need to see myself, but now you can um, see me. So ask if you guys have any questions. Yes. Say, Emily, I love it. You're like asking lots of questions. Can myofunctional therapy be successful with children with intellectual disabilities? Ooh, really good question. Um, I think that I, I think it depends on the severity is how I would answer that question because I have worked with children who have some cognitive impairments and they've been able to learn the exercises adequately and carry them over but i think that if the impairments were more significant you have to just kind of pick and choose what you can use with them um i think strengthening exercises would be fantastic you're doing that with them anyway in their speech therapy and then you're just integrating a little bit of myofunctional therapy in with your repertoire of of therapy so i think that's a great question I think it just depends on the patient. I think it does. Um, please ask away if you have any more questions. I want to tell you about um, an upcoming seminar that I'm going to have in January. First of all, I'm going to be at ASHA um, next month in just a few weeks. And we have a booth. Um, my team will be there with me. And we are there to share with you information about the Simon Says programs, about tongue tips, about thumbs up. Um, to answer any questions that you guys might have to share with you our superheroes that are going to be making their appearance um, and some of the products that we use with our patients and um, 
Also, the other goal of being at ASHA and of being on today's webinar and subsequent webinars is to encourage people to come to our three-day seminar. I, I just had one earlier this month. It was an amazing success. Again, I want only speech therapists to be there because I think speech therapists are the best providers of myofunctional therapy. It's in our wheelhouse, guys. It's in our scope of practice already. We just need to learn the nuances of it so that you can apply it to your, your practice. But what the Simon Says Seminar does is twofold. Um, in the three days, you're gonna learn about what myofunctional therapy is on a more extensive level than what you learned today. You're gonna learn about what different myofunctional disorders look like. I always have clients come in so that we can do practice evaluation and treatment plans. Um, and then the big thing that I provide that I feel like I didn't get enough of last time I went through this um, is that I want you to be able to walk out of that three-day seminar knowing that not only you'll be a success at the therapy, but that you're going to be a success within your practice. So we spend an entire day working on a business plan, helping you guys figure out what you want the myofunctional therapy to be. Do you want it to be the sole part of your practice? You know, I just had one of my um, attendees. She's now gotten office space. She's made connections with three orthodontists, and she's going to be doing a combination of myofunctional therapy and some accent reduction that she already had training in. Um, while I have other people who've attended the seminar, they're just incorporating it into the private practice that they already have. Some other practitioners just want to make this be something that they do on the side on Saturdays to make extra money. So, you know, I want you guys to be able to walk out of the seminar and know that you can be a success and know that you can have your own private practice. I think innately speech therapists are amazing clinicians. We care about people and we want to make a difference in their lives. Myofunctional therapy allows us the ability to do that, to get in, to get out, to make a difference. But what I want Simon Says to be able to provide for you is the education so that you can be a business success as well. So we spend time teaching you about setting up your square dashboards, your online scheduling systems, um, receiving payment online, um, using technology software because the world is going to paperless, guys. It's going to paperless. And when you work with these doctors, they do not want to receive a paper treatment session or a paper progress note. They want everything done through the software systems. So I share information about that. Um, I think, I believe that Julie, when we are done with our webinar today, is gonna to have a link below. Yeah, so if you, right okay, she's gonna load that up right now. First of all, you can reach out with questions anytime, either to myself or to Julie um, after today's webinar. You can also sign up with the registration link for our January seminar. It's gonna be in Baltimore. Um, do we have the dates nailed down for that yet? 26, 27, January 26th, 27th, and 28th. And um, then we're gonna start moving around the country a little bit. So um, we are so excited to be able to share more of what Simon Says has to offer to get you guys learning about myofunctional therapy and then being able to create your own practice and make money up after, as you walk out the door. Um, I make more working two days than I ever did working full-time in the hospitals for 20 years. So it's, this has been life-changing for me and I love what I do and I love making a difference in people's lives. Um, it's really a lot of fun. Any questions that are coming up? I'm so grateful to you guys, especially Emily. Thanks for your questions. I appreciate them. And if you guys have anything else that you want to know, just don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks for taking the time this morning. Take care. Bye-bye.